today's video, we are learning one of the most powerful reactions in organic chemistry. It is the Diels Alder reaction. In 1950, Otto Diels and Kurt Alder actually got the Nobel Prize for this chemistry. What we're doing is we're taking two different alkenes and we are making a ring. Let's do the mechanism. Here we have a diene, and it's called a diene because it has two alkenes, right? So diene, and then here we have a dienophile. File, liking, it loves dienes kind of thing. Okay, so when we draw this mechanism, it's gonna look a little odd. Normally when we start, we always start our electrons at start our arrow, add electrons, which we will, but we're gonna draw it kind of going out into space. It's, it's really not. What's happening is we're making a new bond between our diene and our dienophile. Once this happens, this double bond from our dienophile will then form another single bond, making a new bond here. So once these electrons are added, this carbon needs to get rid of electrons. It's going to push it here. Let's draw what we have. We have a six-membered ring, and then we have our double bond here. It might be easier if I draw our dienophile in green. These two are our carbons from our dienophile. And then our new bond, I'm gonna draw it in a dotted red. And then this, these two are new bonds, okay? Really powerful reaction to make a new ring system. Now, one of the things I'm showing is I'm, I'm showing this with just arrows, and we know that this is a really simplified version of what's actually happening for this reaction. We draw arrows on a 2D piece of paper, but what's really going on, like they're not these simple ball and stick uh, forms. They have these intricate molecular orbitals that are doing all of the chemistry. And molecular orbitals, it's just the probability of where an electron is at around an atom. So let's first, back up just a little bit. We need molecular orbital theory in order to do these reactions efficiently and to really understand them. So we're going to first take an allo anion and we're going to just draw the molecular orbitals for this. Now we know that allo anions, we can draw a resonance structure where that anion is on both carbons, right? So this should be present and very visible when we draw our molecular orbitals where both of the n carbons should have some electron density right this is essentially showing that this allo anion is partially negative on both of the n carbons now we know that with an allo anion we can have we can use this as a nucleophile because it has electrons right and so this is how we can use this in reactions. We can use allo anions as electro as we can use we can use allo anions as nucleophiles. So here I'm just adding D2O. And so the mechanism you would just imagine would be attacking the deuterium. And then here we could either have either side of our allo anion attack, right? So I'm showing here again that that allo anion, that negative charge in our molecular orbitals, we should be able to describe why we have electron density on both sides. To start drawing your molecular orbitals, I'm gonna start with three p orbitals. And your first question might be, why did you choose three? Well, we have one, two, three carbons that are present in our conjugated system. All three carbons are present in our resonance structure and are involved in our resonance structure. Okay, so that's why I know to draw three p orbitals. This conjugated pi system has three carbons. So when we draw our molecular orbitals, we're going to start with three because that's how many I have. Now, if I had, if I had an allo anion that looked like this, okay, there would still only be three orbitals that we would be drawing to explain the reactivity. One, two, three, because only three of these carbons are present in that resonance structure, in that conjugated pi system. Okay, enough of that. We have three orbitals. The first and the lowest energy orbital is going to have all of the p orbitals shaded. It's gonna be symmetrical. The shaded nature of these p orbitals is simply just what the sign of the wave function is for these p orbitals. We're not gonna dive into the mathematics. I, I don't worry about it, okay? But the key here is that 
um, I'm going to write a zero beside it. It has zero nodes. Okay. You'll understand in just a second. This is the number of nodes. Okay. So our next molecular orbital, we are going to have one node that will be present. Now this node needs to be down the middle of our compound. And if we look at this, the node would have to be placed right over this P orbital. And so really what happens is that we don't even have electron density at that P orbital. Instead, we have essentially just this node. And so this is how we'll draw our next higher up molecular orbital. The two P orbitals on the end will be flipped, okay? Our next molecular orbital will have two nodes. Again, there's three carbons in our conjugated pi system, so we'll draw three orbitals. And let's see if we can symmetrically get two nodes in. Well, it looks like we can. We can draw a node here, and we can draw a node here. Cool, okay, so there's our two nodes. This means that on either side of the node, the p orbital needs to be flipped. So if I start on the top, on my left, then this one has to be down, and this one has to be up. Just a side note, the highest molecular orbital for any conjugated pi system is always going to have them all flipped, okay? And so that's one way you can kind of get around if you've got a big system, the lowest one, they're all on the same side, and the one that's the highest in energy, they're all flipped, okay? All right, and if you're thinking to yourself, what the heck is a p orbital, I should just, maybe it's easier if I... Uh, uh, show it with balloons. Maybe not. Okay, so p orbital. Uh, again, it's a uh, dumbbell shape. Here is our carbon, okay, shaded only just because of the, the uh, sign of the wave function. Here's the deal though. We have now our three molecular orbitals for our allo anion. We need to fill these molecular orbitals with electrons to figure out which orbitals are doing the chemistry. How many pi electrons do we have for an allo anion? How many pi electrons? Well, we have a double bond. That would be two electrons. There's two electrons in that pi, pi bond. Then we also have this anion. So that's two more. And if I can do math, that equals four. There's four pi electrons in our allo anion. Okay. When you fill in the electrons, you always start at the lowest. Electrons are always paired, so you're going to draw one up and one down. Then you're going to fill in the other two. We have two more, so that makes four, right? There's two pi electrons and two more pi electrons. When you draw these in, now you can start labeling your molecular orbitals with new terminology that I'm going to show you. This one here is considered the, the HOMO, which is the highest highest occupied molecular orbital. The orbital directly above our HOMO is considered the LUMO. It is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. It's these two orbitals that do all of the chemistry. In this case, when we had an allo anion, we had it react as a nucleophile, right? In this case, our nucleophile could add the deuterium on either carbon on the end. I said before, we should be able to describe this reactivity with our molecular orbitals. So let's see if we did. The reactivity of an allo anion is going to be happening from the HOMO here. And if you look at the HOMO, which has one node, the two carbons on the end have electron density. When we have this node present, it's essentially saying there's no electron density at this carbon here, okay? That's what that dot means. There's no p orbital, there's no electron density here. And so this describes the reactivity of an allyl anion very well, that our HOMO has, our HOMO has two pi electrons, it's the highest occupied molecular orbital. Those electrons are the most easy to react because they're highest in energy. And that is why we see reactivity on both sides 
of our owl anion because our HOMO has electron density on either end of our owl anion based on this um, molecular orbital drawing. Very cool, right? Okay, so now we have this. Let's do an allocation. Let's first draw a resonance structure. This is essentially saying that both sides of our allocation are partially positive. We know that this can act as an electrophile, right? Let's just say we add methanol, okay? We can do a solvolysis and react on one end. I'm gonna lose H plus. And then we can also get it to react on the other side. Now these two products are the same, but I'm just highlighting that both sides of our allyl cation can act as an electrophile. Okay, we should be able to prove this with our molecular orbitals. Let's draw molecular orbitals. We have one, two, three carbons in our pi system. And again, if I had something drawn like this, we still only have one, two, three carbons involved in our pi system because these are the only ones, if you draw resonance, showing any pi electrons, okay? So let's do this. Our lowest energy, we know we've got three p orbitals, cool. We know that we're going to shade all of the ones on one side. This is our lowest energy. It should have zero nodes. Cool. Let's do our next one, which is going to have one node. Okay, and let's draw our highest energy one. The highest en energy one has each of our p orbitals flipped in shading. And cool, we have two nodes. And here's our one node. Great, guess what? This is the same thing that we just drew on the allyl um, anion side, okay? I just made you do it just for practice. <laughs> so that's how we draw the molecular orbitals. It's essentially the same, right? Now what is different here is gonna come up when we fill in our electrons. Now how many pi electrons do I have in an allyl cation? Well, we have two pi electrons here in our double bond, and that's it. We have a positive charge, okay? So this compound here has two pi electrons. So we're gonna start at the lowest energy molecular orbital, and we're gonna fill in our two electrons, and that's all we have. That means that here is our HOMO, our highest occupied molecular orbital, and the one right above it is our LUMO. Notice that this is different than the allyl anion, okay? The molecular orbitals are the same, but when we look at the number of pi electrons, that changes which one is the highest occupied and which one is the lowest unoccupied. So again, draw your molecular orbitals, count your pi electrons, and then fill them in, and then you'll get to see your homo and lumo every time. So based on this, now my question is, the reaction with methanol showed that the allyl cation was an electrophile, and it could add on either side, on either side on, of the N carbons. As an electrophile, we know that electrophiles accept electrons, they want electrons. So based on our molecular orbital diagram here, does it make sense that this allyl cation can react at either carbon? Well, it sure can, our LUMO, okay, is gonna be used because it doesn't have electrons. So that's where it's gonna be attacked. And on either end of our allyl cation, we have a molecular orbital there on our LUMO. This is just kind of highlighting how we're using these molecular orbitals. Okay, so let's do another example. And we're gonna, I'm not gonna make you redraw the, the molecular orbitals. Let's see what happens with Okay, so this one was for our allyl cation. Let's do the allyl radical. This is gonna get really fun. Okay, so we're gonna use the same molecular orbitals. Okay, so the same molecular orbitals are being used. Now all I'm gonna do 
just draw lines here and we're going to just fill, we're just going to fill in the electrons and then label our HOMO and LUMO. Okay. My first question is how many pi electrons? Well, there's two here in our double bond and then we have one here. So there's three pi electrons. Okay, we know we want our electrons paired up. So we're gonna put our two electrons here at the lowest molecular orbital. Then we still have one electron left. So we're gonna put it in the orbital right above it. So we see here that our lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is now this top one with two nodes, okay? And this one with one electron has a different name. It's a type of a HOMO, but it's called a SOMO. It is a singly occupied molecular orbital. So in the cases of radicals, you're always going to have that SOMO and that is where the reaction is going to happen. It's gonna be happening at the SOMO, okay? If we have an allo radical, we've seen this react with other radicals, right? So this makes sense that a SOMO will react with another SOMO, okay, of another molecule. So just again, we've now learned three new terms, the HOMO, the LUMO, the SOMO. You've learned how to draw the molecular orbitals and fill them in with the electrons no matter what structure that you get. Let's try something. So let's go back to our diels alder reaction and let's fill in the molecular orbitals. So here we have our diene and our dienophile. Let's draw our molecular orbitals. For our diene, we have one, two, three, four carbons that are in this pi conjugated system, okay? Now, if I had a carbon kind of flanked off here or flanked off here and maybe here, I'm still only going to draw, even if I had like a long alkyl chain, I'm still only going to draw four p orbitals because those are the four carbons that are have the p orbitals, okay? Those are the ones that are this sp2 hybridized, okay? So let's draw molecular orbitals. We're going to start one, two, three, and four. Great. Let's shade in all of the ones on one side. Let's do our number of nodes. Zero, okay. This next one up should have one. Now we have an even number of p orbitals, so we don't have to draw the uh, dot that we drew in the last one. We can draw a node right here down the middle. This just means that then the p orbitals on the other side of the line are flipped. Okay, that's our second one. Let's draw our third one. This one's going to have two nodes. Okay, and then our last one, I told you before, our highest energy molecular orbital will have all of the p orbitals flipped. This should give us three nodes. Ta-da, it did. Okay, cool. The nodes are just showing that it's flipped, okay? The p orbital there sign is flipped. Okay, so three nodes there at the top. This is our diene. Let's now label, fill in how many electrons. Okay, so we have two here and two here. That means we have four pi electrons. All right, now let's label our highest occupied molecular orbital. It's our HOMO, okay? And then our lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. This is our LUMO. Okay, we did our diene. Now let's do our dienophile. Our dienophile here has one, two carbons, okay? That means that we're going to have two p orbitals. They're gonna be shaded on the same side for the lowest energy. And then for our next level up, we are going to have one node, okay? 
one node and zero nodes, right? Okay, so let's fill in our electrons. How many pi electrons do we have for this one? Well, we have two pi electrons. There's one double bond, right? So let's fill in our electrons here. Okay, now let's label our HOMO and our LUMO. Our HOMO is the highest occupied molecular orbital. The only occupied molecular orbital in this is here. And then our LUMO is our lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Now, I just told you all of this stuff, and you're probably wondering, okay, what the heck does it have to do with a Diels alder, right? Let me just write dienophile. Well, let's redraw, let's redraw our mechanism here. Okay, we're going to make a six-membered ring with a double bond right here. And here's what you need to know. So the diene uses the homo, okay? And the dienophile uses the lumo. This is going to be really important because we're going to talk about how we can make a diels alder reaction fast. Here I have heat. You actually need a lot of heat. This reaction doesn't actually work that well, okay? So let's dive in to figure out how we can make this reaction go faster, and we're going to use our molecular orbitals to see how we've affected the energy levels. We need our LUMO from our dienophile and our HOMO from our diene to match up or to be as close as possible in energy so that those electrons can go in between those two orbitals. So let's dive in. I've got a few rules of how we can do this. We have an important message from Rody. Lovastatin is used to treat high blood cholesterol its biosynthesis involves an enzyme-catalyzed intramolecular diels alder reaction of the triene. You can see the triene here at the pink arrow, and notice the diels alder reaction forms the desired cyclohexene. All right, so we know the dienophile is going to use its LUMO, and the diene will use its HOMO in order for the reaction to occur. What I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw, let's, let's redraw our product, right? We've got our cyclohexene, I'll draw our mechanism with these arrows that don't really show us a lot about the chemistry here. And we're going to use the HOMO from our diene and then our LUMO from our dienophile, okay? So let's go back to this slide. Our LUMO for our dienophile has the 2p orbitals flipped and our HOMO has one node, right? So our HOMO has four P orbitals, our LUMO has two. You know, these are flipped, it has one node, and then our HOMO here also has one node. Okay, let's draw this in, a, try to draw this in a 3D kind of fashion here. So we've got, so we have four P orbitals for our diene. These two are shaded, and then the next two are shaded on the bottom. Okay, and let's draw our dienophile. We're drawing the dienophile attacking or re, uh, reacting with the diene from below. And this also has one node. So this has two nodes. Sorry, and this also has one node. Okay. Now what we're showing here, this interaction, I'm going to show you in pink. It's this, the tops of our dienophile are reacting with the bottom of the p orbital of our diene, okay? So the bottom part of our diene is interacting with the top part of our dienophile, and also the bottom part of our diene is is interacting with the top part of this p orbital of our dienophile. 
I think this definitely will be easier if I use some balloons. Okay, balloons are kind of hard to deal with, but I think I got it now. We're gonna use a really fancy molecular orbital, uh, a really fancy model kit to explain this with balloons. Okay, this is a diene, and it has four p orbitals. Jeez, four p orbitals. Boop. This is our, this is our homo. That's right. And so um, what we're doing here is you can kind of see that there's definitely a double bond, definitely a double bond. Cool. Okay. Diene. Dienophile. Guess who ran out of teal balloons? I did. Okay. So the dienophile has a lumo. Both of the orbitals are um, flipped, right? And so what we're going to be doing is we need to overlap the two N carbons. Okay. So you just need to see how the green... Okay, the pink and the red are the same. The teal and the green are the same. Okay, I've ran out of colors, okay? Um, all right, so see how this is going to attack from the bottom. And the, bo the top of this, the top of the dienophile, the tops of the orbitals are interacting with the bottoms of the diene, okay? See how, okay, maybe if I move back a little. There we go. Look at that. Look at that interaction with that pink balloon and the green and the teal. See how they're interacting. Yeah. So, so what's happening here is the orbitals are very important. They have to line up. Okay. If we used, if we didn't use the LUMO for the dienophile, this reaction couldn't work. Okay. The bottoms of this diene are opposite. That's why the LUMO works, right? Okay. This is super important because if we use our LUMO, we can actually make this reaction go faster by changing what's on our dienophile. We can also make the reaction go faster if we change what's on the diene. Now, one of the key things here with this diene is that it has to be in an S cis. I'll draw it and then I'll show you with my really expensive model kit, okay? First, let's draw an S cis conformation. This is an S cis. This is an S trans, okay? So if we were to react, this is our diene, okay? This is awesome because it is stuck in an S cis. However, if we try to react with something like, like this, This will not work. So if your dying is stuck in an S trans, okay, stuck in an S trans, your dienophile can interact with this orbital here, but it it can't interact with that teal one all the way on the end. See how that's too far away? So it can interact with this one, but it can't interact on the one on the end. Okay, so it's gotta be in an S cis. So S cis, cool, S cis. And now, if I can position this a little better. My fancy model kit isn't working right now. There we go. See how they, they can interact now, okay? So the pink, I can interact with the red, and the green is now interacting with that teal, see? Okay, S cis, very important. Electron donating groups on the diene actually make this reaction occur faster. What am I talking about here? Well, if I have a, let's say an OME group here on our diene, this is going to make the reaction occur faster. So electron donating groups, think about amines. Methoxy groups. And you could also have R groups. Now, the amine is going to be the best and then it kind of goes down from there. But these are examples of electron donating groups. They also typically, 
increase the energy of our molecular orbital, of our HOMO. Again, we're using our HOMO for our dying. And if we add electron donating groups, this is going to increase the energy of that HOMO a little bit. Of the molecular orbitals. Let's just prove to ourselves these are donating groups. We can take the lone pair from the nitrogen and push it in. And we can show resonance going through the entire molecule here. Right? So these are all electron donating groups. Our dienophile needs to have an electron withdrawing group on it. So something like a cyano group will work very well. So electron withdrawing groups that you can use, we can use a nitro group. It's a cyano group like I have here. You can use halides, although they're not as electron withdrawing. Well, another very good one would be a carbonyl, right? And so we can draw this resonance showing that it is, an, in fact, an electron withdrawing group. By adding electron withdrawing groups to our dienophile, we're actually going to lower the energy of our LUMO. I'm going to write MOs for molecular orbitals, okay? I should note here that it really needs an electron drawing group. Nitros are used a lot. These are really great, as well as these cyano groups and carbonyls. You don't see a lot of the halides being used, but you can use them. So I'm going to write, this one's like best. The nitro group is really good for this. Okay, so we're going to lower the energy of the LUMO, okay? That kind of, oh, that's kind of nice. LUMO. We're going to try and lower it. And the HOMO here for the diene, we're going to make higher by adding our electron donating group. Let's look at an example of where we draw our HOMO of our diene and our LUMO of our dienophile. Let's add either an electron withdrawing group or a donating group and see how that interacts with the molecular orbitals. See what happens. So let's draw our diene. So let's draw the molecular orbital. So I'm going to draw the HOMO. This is just, this is the one with one node. So this is our HOMO. We know this has two electrons. Now, if we were to add an electron donating group like I have here with this methoxy, what will happen is that the energy of this HOMO is actually going to be a little higher, okay? Here's our dienophile. We know that LUMOs are higher than HOMOs, right? These are higher in energy. Okay, I'm going to draw my LUMO. It's got one node. We have no electrons in our LUMO. And if we take this dienophile and we add electron withdrawing groups on it, let's add an NO2 group, we're going to lower the energy of this molecular orbital. Okay, so here is our LUMO, and we've essentially lowered the, the orbital energy here, the molecular orbital energy. Now, I'm going to draw this in a blue line. Notice here that the original reaction, look how far away the energies of our molecular orbitals were. So what we did was we took our HOMO and we raised the energy by adding the electron donating group. We took our LUMO and we lowered the energy by adding an electron withdrawing group. And now check out how close these orbitals are. So essentially we're just bringing the orbitals closer so that these 
electrons here in this homo can jump ship and react with that dienophile. This is how we make a diels alder reaction go faster. So again, we have number one, S cis. It has to be in an S, has to be in an S cis confirmation. Number two, add electron donating groups to your diene. Number three, add electron withdrawing groups to your dienophile. I'll see you in the next video.